recording. Share my screen. Okay, awesome. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, welcome everybody. Tonight we have a really great program. Oh, and if you all would remain on mute, that'd be awesome just for, because we can hear rustling in the background. So if you just wanna go on mute while I do my intro, that'd be fabulous. So welcome everybody. We have micro enterprise finances, how your financial statements work and the story they tell about your business. So I'm super excited to have Ross Kanaga here today. Ross, am I saying your last name right? No, that's okay though. It's Kanaga, but Kanaga, no. No I should worries. No Ross worries. Ross Kanaga here um, from Dev Northwest. He's been a partner, longtime partner with Oregon Rain um, and a great asset to the community. And I'll introduce him more later. And I'm sure we'll get to hear his intro of himself as well. I'm Ariel Rubin, the Lane County Venture Catalyst with Oregon Rain. I also own my own marketing firm and like to say I'm the innovation strategist for my family's business, Hummingbird Wholesale, right in Eugene. Um, oh, I actually have the wrong agenda for this, but we're gonna get, uh, I think we'll go a full hour. And Ross, I just wanted to check with you about Q&A. Um, yeah. Do you wanna have like Q&A throughout or do you wanna have Q&A right at the end? You know, I think, um... I think it'll be good to actually just throw questions in the chat as we're going okay. through the different um, pieces. Um, and awesome. maybe we'll spend a couple minutes at the end, but um, like probably a lot of presentations you've been to, I probably tried to pack too much into an hour. So Okay, good. So we'll just do questions throughout. Um, just a little virtual etiquette. Please remain muted throughout the session just because of the rustling in the background. But you can unmute if you have questions. You're welcome to put them in the chat, as Ross mentioned. Or you can also use the raise hand feature. And this is a place for fun, learning, and inclusivity. Please be polite, supportive, and positive in conversations and in the chat. Uh, this event is being recorded, just a reminder. So I will send it after the fact if you all want to review. Or for those of you that weren't able to attend, I'll you know make sure to share that. Um, Oregon Rain, we partner with communities to catalyze entrepreneurial ecosystems, connect entrepreneurs to resources, including overlooked entrepreneurs, and contribute to the creation of prosperous economies. And we do that by creating what we, we like to say is infrastructure for startups. So that would be making sure that there's mentors, networking opportunities, workshops, physical assets, capital, news and media activated, local government support, um, workforce, etc. And we can't do that alone. So we love to say that we're catalyzing community. So we're building partnerships. Please join in. We're always stronger together. We love to hear your ideas, especially now. Stay connected and all are welcome. A huge thank you to our partners, mentors, entrepreneurs, and funders. We love creating thriving entrepreneurial ecosystems with all of you. This is our team. We've been growing and growing this year. Um, poor Corey is the only male right now, but it's a strong female team at this point. Um, we're all here to serve you. We have venture catalysts across Oregon. Um, and if your city does not have access to a venture catalyst, you can always request us. So let us know. Um, what's next? So there's always free resources available. You're always welcome to reach out to me and I can let you know what's up. Um, I also provide ongoing weekly mentorship to make sure that you're connected with the right people. Um, and we have some awesome workshops and programs. So the Money Maker is a three month uh, financial accelerator and applications are actually closed, but they're secretly open. <laughs> so if you all did not apply, this is a seriously good opportunity. Don't miss out. It's March 31st through June 30th. Um, every Wednesday morning from 9 to 10.30. We know it's a big commitment. It's three months, an hour and a half every week. Um, there'll be homework and resources and activities, but you will not regret it. Um, you'll have a great understanding of the whole finances of your business. Uh, on the 16th, that's tomorrow, 9 a.m., we have another workshop, Make Your Website Work For You. And Carissa is actually from Google. So she's She's uh, zooming in from Google and she ha she'll have some great tips for you. So please join. Um, intro to the business model canvas. So this is sort of the startup version of a business plan. So if you'd like sort of the short and sweet version of a business plan, um, please join us on March 24th at 10 a.m. with Joe Marushak. 
Um, and how to craft a successful brand. I'm super thrilled that we have Christina Scott. I've actually worked with her in the past to do the branding for a startup company that I was a part of, Hazel People. She's out of Portland. She's also worked with Nike and some other big brands. So don't miss that. It'll be a great one. Okay, tonight's program is on. So I'm really excited to have Ross here. Ross, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you. So okay. please introduce yourself. Yeah, well, hello, everyone. My name is Ross Kinnig, and I work with Dev Northwest. Um, we just changed our name about a year ago from Nedco. Um, and there's two big things that we do that are related to entrepreneurs. Probably the most, the thing that maybe some of you know about is we actually have an arm called Community Lending Works, where uh, we support um, um, entrepreneurs with access to capital, um, usually kind of smaller, smaller um, scale entrepreneurs, especially bridging the gap. Um, be, you know, if you're in a space and you're not quite um, ready or able to get other forms of financing. Um, and so we're what's called a CDFI, Community Development Financial Institution. Um, and our mission is to support undercapitalized communities. Um, and so that would be um, communities of color, but also undercapitalized entrepreneurs. Um, we also do programming. Um, we do a lot of financial well-being programming, and I like to say that you know when you you know you all are small business owners, you know you got your your personal financial house and your your business financial house, and sometimes they kind of meld, <laughs> you know, they 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 come together sometimes, and so it's it's really valuable to take some steps to actually build your personal financial house um, that can be helpful to your personal finances, to your business as well. Uh, whether you do that with any of our programming or you do that <clears throat> on your own. Um, my title, it's funny, my title is financial innovation manager, which I'm like, I don't know what that means. So Ariel, <laughs> we have, we both have these foo-foo foo -foo titles. Um, but today, um, I want to, we're going to talk about financial um, statements and like the, and I'll, let me, let me jump into sharing my screen. Um, like, like um, Ariel alluded to earlier, um, you know, a lot of times, you know, you start a business and you're really good at doing what you do, right? Um, and, um, but there's a whole different aspect about, you know, running the business and, and, you know, um, whether you are actually doing your own accounting or, or having somebody else do your accounting, it's really important to analyze your financial um, statements and use them as a tool to make business decisions. Um, so like what our goals for today are, we're really gonna talk about the main three financial statements. So let me, let me actually um, stop my share and jump. So we're, gonna, we're just going to talk, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to be relatively basic. We're going to talk about balanced, uh, balance sheet, your income statement, and your statement of cash flow, or sometimes you've heard of it as cash flow project, projections. But we're going to talk about it like looking at it kind of like a story. And, um, and the goal is to leave this workshop feeling more comfortable reading what do they say, um, seeing how they relate to each other because they each have a kind of a different role and kind of all together um, they, they wrap up and play, you know, they each, they each have an important role um, and together they, they tell a bigger picture. And then, and then finally, like I, I said is, and that is like how, what are some things that you can do to analyze the specific um, statements? And so we're gonna do kind of some very, very basic um, ratio analysis um, because that's really helpful to look at some of our financial statements. We're gonna look at a scenario, um, a very, very kind of uh, small um, scenario. So let me in the chat um, put a link. If you'd like to follow along with the handouts, um, I also put a copy of the slides um, in the hand in the in this link as well. So if you want a copy of the slide, so so Sarah asks, why not the PL? It's a great question. The income statement is the PL or the profit and loss. They're the same thing, just different terminology. So we will talk about the PL, but we're just gonna call it um, the income statement. Um, okay, so I have a couple of questions for you just to get a sense of the audience. So let me stop the share again and go back. So in the chat, get your chat fingers ready. In the chat, can you put 
Um, how many years have you been in business? And I know some of you, maybe this is like you're coming to Rain, Oregon, Oregon Rain, just um, kind of early on in your journey. So maybe it's zero, but put in the chat, how many years have you been in business? Okay, so we got 11, 4, 2.5, 5. Hi, Samantha. I know Samantha. Um, so great. So there's so some of you have been in business for quite some time. Eve, Ava, you you win 30 years. Congratulations. That's that's incredible. Um, okay, how many of you, the next question of you, how many of you resonate with this statement? I love numbers. Why for yes or an N for no? A Y for yes and N for no. If you're not really sure in the middle, you could put a question mark. So we got some, we got some, uh, some people who love numbers. Absolutely. And some people, it depends. Yes, it depends. That's a good answer. And then my final question for you all is, do you already, I already use QuickBooks or something, or something similar, um, some sort of, um, so put a Y for yes or an N for no. Okay, kind of a mixed bag here. So yeah, web-based QuickBooks counts, absolutely. Okay, so we're gonna, let's jump in. So we're gonna start by talking about the balance sheet. The balance sheet. So in the chat, why do they call it the balance sheet? Why do they call it the balance sheet? I know, I know there's so many people who've been in business for a while. They call it the balance sheet because it has to what? Because it balances, absolutely. So let's look at this slide, next slide. So you've probably heard of the equation, your total assets equals your total liabilities with an asterisk. And that asterisk is owner's equity. So if you have a little, if you have more assets than liability, then that extra amount is your owner's equity. So a balance sheet will always equal. So some people look at a balance sheet and are like, wow, my assets are really going up. Well, you'll likely see, um, you know, your liabilities are up too. Um, maybe unless you, of course, your owner's equity has gone up a lot as well. So basically, what a balance sheet is looking at your, your current kind of financial position at a very specific point of time. Um, it's, it's kind of reconciling what you own uh, versus what you owe. Um, and so let's actually look at an example. And if you, um, so we're gonna look at Mary's leather goods throughout the, throughout the hour tonight. And so kind of let's walk through this. And if you have, if you've gone to the link, you can pull up the PDF and follow along um, with that or just, or just use the Zoom presentation. So we'll, de we'll define a couple of terms um, in just a second. But at the very top, we have our assets. And then we have uh, on the bottom, we have our liabilities and owner equity. And we, we're just doing three years here, 2014, 15, and 16. So, um, there, so current assets. So current is, is maybe a new term. Does anybody want to take a stab on what is a current asset or a current liability in the chat? So a current asset is something that couldn't be liquidated that, yeah, I like what Sarah says, cash can definitely be a current asset, assets that you have on hand now. So look at in this example, the three things that we consider that are current assets are cash, accounts receivable. That's, of course, money that is owed to you as the business. So we're going to count that as an asset as opposed to a liability. And then inventory. I mean, that's something that's worth value. But the thing that makes it specifically a current asset is it's something that you can uh, liquidate probably within a one-year time frame. So, of course, cash is liquid already. So that makes sense. Now, inventory is a little bit sticky. You have inventory, but the idea is that probably you can cycle through inventory in a year. So current assets are things that are basically, um, that, that can be, that can be, um, that you can 
liquefy in a year. And, and that's the same as, um, as current liabilities. And this is gonna come back, we're gonna come back to this in just a second. On the current liability side, of course, we have um, accounts payable. So that's money that you may not have paid, but because you owe it, we're gonna count that as a liability. And then of course, we have some other different types of debt. So we've got some, some, uh, some notes payable, current portion of long-term debt. Um, so we've got some debt there. And then at the very bottom, we see the owner's equity. And this, this comes in two forms. One is the owner's investment into the business, but also earnings that have been retained, that have been basically fed to the balance sheet from the income statement. So before we actually go into analyzing this, um, this, uh, this uh, three years of these balance sheets, does anybody have any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself about any terminology um, or what you're seeing here. Hi, I'm curious as to whether the materials you use to create your product would be considered current assets. So the, the, the materials that you're creating your, your, your business or product, let's just say you have a bakery and you're making, um, you're making cookies. Well, if you have, if you have some material, then that would probably, um, yeah, that would definitely be an asset. That would be part of your, your inventory. It's going to definitely be more important when we come, um, in, when we, when we get into talking about the profit and loss and the, and the, uh, the, uh, um, the, the income statement, but it's not cash. It's not accounts receivable. So, um, yeah, I would probably count it as you know part of the inventory, but in this case, it's not inventory of, of finished goods. It'd be inventory to help, help you actually create something. Uh, cost of goods, yep, we'll, we're gonna get into that in, when we're talking about the, the uh, income statement. So those are, those are all the, yeah, those would be all the inputs that help you produce, especially if you're making a product. Um, okay. So let's actually let before we actually like really dive into analysis of this of this uh, balance sheet. What are some kind of broad observations that you've noticed um, um, about kind of trends that you see from two thousand fourteen to two thousand sixteen? Feel, and I think I'm going to invite you to, you can put it in the chat, but feel free to unmute yourself as well. What do we see? A lot of investment back into the business. Yeah, so it looks like each year, um, a lot, yeah, so, so the investment is growing. When, let's just, let's even take a step back. When we just look at the assets and the liability, what do we see there? Am so we I see like assets here? and liabilities are both growing. So our first thought is maybe that this is a growing business. Is that fair? Is that is that something that you would maybe surmise? Looks like you know over two years the current assets and liabilities increased quite quite a you know percentage wise quite a bit. Yeah. So Laura mentioned that that we're starting to see receivables um, grow quite a bit. Um, we're also um, grateful. Uh, graphi um, graphics mentioned that um, that they bought a vehicle. So what do we see? Mm -hmm. So so when we so when we're when we're looking at the um, balance sheet, um, you know, there's there's kind of different intentions. One is. Uh, yes. So, Sarah, what do you mean that there was a dip in 2015? Can you just, can you articulate what you mean by that? It looks to me, it, and I could, could be completely off the wall. Um, 2014 looked like he was doing pretty well. Profits went down a bit where re, 
uh, liabilities went up a bit and then and, 20 and just to be clear we don't we don't have anything about profits yet but you're saying assets, oh, okay assets. assets went down liabilities yeah. went up and then 2016 assets seem to go up more more than they you know 2016 on the asset side looks better than 2015 when liabilities they, they just look more balanced in 2016 than they do in 2015. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. And some people said, okay, they definitely bought some things. So, um, so there's, yeah, so there's, there's a new, there's a, um, it looks like they bought in 2016, a new vehicle, um, but also machinery and tools really kind of went up in 16 as well. Um, great points. Great points. Um, so, but then also we notice if we look at the liability size, it looks like they're taking on a little bit more debt. Um, is that fair to say? And potentially they could be associated with, yeah. So Erica says that probably, it looks like 2016 was a year of expansion and I, and I would not disagree. And so this is where it's all about balance, right? Um, is, uh, is a, a balance sheet kind of helps us take a little snapshot on the financial health of of, of the business. So we're going to, let me um, unshare my screen. The, the, the first thing that we're going to look at is what's called the current ratio. And the current ratio um, helps us, is basically used a lot by lenders. And, it, and they use it to kind of like take a, um, a snapshot of, is, is this uh, company, like, what's their kind of like, What's the level of financial health? So let me get out of here real quickly and let me twist my, sh my uh, screens around. Okay. Actually, current slide. Okay, so we're gonna go back to sharing screen. And now I think I can pull it. So the, so the current ratio is, is, is to calculate it, you take the current assets divided by the current liabilities. And the current, the current, um, the current ratio basically says, hey, for every, for every dollar of liabilities I have, I have this many assets to cover in case things kind of you know, take, take a turn for the worse. Um, and so generally speaking, a goal is to have a current ratio of, a, of, of about two, um, so that you have about two liabilities for every, excuse me, two assets for every liability that you have. We're gonna, we're gonna divide into groups and maybe we'll do it based off of your first name. If your name is like A through H, why don't you calculate 2014? If you're, um, if we see the F, G, J, H, I, if you're I through P, why don't you do 15 and then Q through Z 2016. And once you get your numbers, put them in the chat and we'll, and I'll um, record them here. Um, but we're gonna like see what the trend is um, because um, let's, let's check it out. So take a second, if you've got a calculator on your computer or on your phone, calculate what's the current assets of that year divided by the current liabilities. And you know what? I realize some of you may not have the handouts up, so let me let me pull up the the slides again, so you can see. So I see the chats coming in. Oh yeah. So I'll work with people who are doing 2014. If we did 2014, the total current assets are 5,100. The total current liabilities are 1,900. So we would take 5,100 divided by 1,900 and tell me what that is. So if you do put something in the chat, um, let me know what year it was too. So 
Uh, Linda, I assume, I think that's 2014. Is that right? So we'll put 2014 as 2.68? Yes. Great. If you finish one, you can go work on another one. I should ask, can every, like, and Ariel, let me ask you too, can you actually see my screen enough to see the numbers? Because I don't want to put people in a situation where they can't see. Yeah, we can see the numbers, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. So I think, I, I assume that's for 2016. Or no, is that for, what year is that for? It says 2019, but we got 2014. 2016, 2016. got yes. it. Okay. Okay. So did everybody get these numbers? Um, you know what? The only one I would I would re I would double check is 2016 because look at this, the current uh, total current liabilities are 12,250, and the total current um, liabilities are 12,320. So I'm, it looks like it's about one. In fact, it's a little bit less than one. So I'm gonna guess it's about 0.99. So help me out here. This is, this is kind of enlightening, right? It looks like it's kind of a jumbled bunch of numbers, but once we actually see um, the, once we actually calculate each year, what, what do we see um, is the trend? Somebody earlier said that this is a growing company. Um, so liquidity is down. Actually, um, you're right. So liquidity in kind of a longer term is definitely maybe down. Um, so what I would say, does anybody want to take a stab at what kind of analyzing these numbers? Um, so remember, so in 2014, it's saying that for every dollar of of assets that we have, we have, excuse me, for every dollar of liabilities that we have, we have $2.68 dollars $2 of, um, of assets to cover it. And then by the time we get to 2016, for every dollar of liability that we have, we only have 99 cents to cover it. So this is, so basically this is, this is, we're getting to a situation where we're in a dangerous spot. I mean, if this is, look at, I mean, this worksheet is a little bit old, but um, if, if this happened and this business um, had a challenging year during COVID, like it could be, it could be really tough. And so, um, so just know that that, so, so in this situation, the, the business is really definitely trying to expand but they're de definitely expanding at a cost. And if we look deeper into the numbers, we see that they're definitely taking on a lot more loans, which again, is maybe what they need to do in order to grow, but they're getting into a place that's, that's a little bit risk, that's a little bit, a little bit shaky. So we're gonna do one other ratio analysis for the- um... I had a couple of comments on this. Um, Please. Although I- <laughs> You asked us if we if we like numbers or love numbers, and I said uh, depend on the context. So if you were going to ask me, did I like numbers when I had to do a calculation? The answer would be no, because I get the, the I get the answer wrong. Um, and here I'll take my, my uh, video off. But as far as liking numbers, when I just look at them and do some some snapshot analysis, the two things that got me is as soon as I looked at this, and I don't mean instantly. I had to kind of look at the numbers for a while. First, this company's got a problem in 2016 on collecting. 
So if you look at their accounts receivable, they are having a growing problem with um, collecting on their sales. So if this was a company in 2016, read 2020, that was the first thing I looked at. And then I went straight to their liabilities and I looked at, well, what's their short term and their long term? Because as soon as you have problems with cash coming in, the question is, how much do I have to pay immediately? Is someone going to come knocking on my door and how much of it is long term debt? Yes. So I looked at how, what was the ratio, not so much to assets and liabilities, but it was current liabilities to long term liabilities. Mm -hmm. So on that, half, I think roughly half of their liabilities was short term. Now yes. it's notes. So there's two things they could do on that that are, you know, if you do your calculation, it's really not going to enlighten it because the ratios are going to look the same. Those notes could be changed into a five year term. Mm -hmm. That I don't know if that would change it from being a, a current, but this should need to be a long term shift those notes or the short term debt into long term debt. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the first thing they could do so that they're not at risk if this was a COVID year. But the other thing I would do is I would turn right around and make sure that we're collecting on all of that accounts receivable and get it down to two weeks. Yeah. So those are the two things they could do to get out of danger. Um, but the rest of it, I'd have to then spend a lot of time on because I'm not a numbers person. <laughs> well, I, Greta, those are fantastic observations and, and really appreciate you sharing. Um, so, so the next one that we're going to dive into is kind of taking a step further. And this is, it's called the, uh, it's called the quick ratio. And so the quick ratio is going to be very similar to the, um, is going to be very similar to the the current ratio except it's it's we're, remember with the current ratio we're saying we would have a year to generate that cash the quick ratio says if basically can i swear ariel is it okay if shit hits the fan and i need to generate like cash literally within this month like what like would i be able to do it and this i mean i think this kind of plays in what greta was talking about on you know, maybe there's some things that you could do to, to restructure, but then all of a sudden we start looking at, we start looking at the uh, current assets, and um, and so when we look for the quick ratio, what do we think? Cash, of course, like quite cash, like we have cash on hand, so we can quickly um, utilize that. Accounts receivable, um, you know, assuming that they're like net 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 thirty, like they're actually considered fairly liquid as well. Unfortunately, inventory is not quite as liquid. And so the only difference for the quick ratio is we actually do the same calculation, but we minus inventory. And um, so let me put on the, okay, for the current ratio, the rule of thumb is two to one, but for the quick ratio, the goal, the rule of thumb or the heuristic is to try to have one to one. Because so that is for every dollar of liability that I have, I want to at least have one dollar that I can quickly access, access to you know to cover to cover whatever the surprise um, would be. So I think you all are going to know where this goes. Let's just for the purposes of um, of quickness, um, no pun intended. How about everybody whose birthday is um, January to? to June, why don't you all calculate 2014 and 2000, oh, bummer. 2000 um, for if you're uh, July through um, December, calculate 2016. So the, so again, the, the equation here is we're gonna take current, current um, assets minus inventory. And we're gonna divide that by current liabilities. So again, I'm going to, so again, current assets minus inventory divided by current liabilities. Another way, of course, you could do that is just cash plus accounts receivables divided by current liabilities. So does everybody have that equation up? And now I'm gonna I'm gonna move it over so that you can see the um, the numbers again. Are we doing 15, 16, or we're gonna just do 14 and 16? We're going to look 15. at great. We're going to do 14 and 16.
And I'm going to do, while well, you all are working on it, I'll do 16 with you all. Okay, so things are coming in the chat. Thank, thanks, Ariel, for putting that in. Yeah. Yep, so Laura says maybe they're overextending themselves. I mean, all of this has to do with risk, right? You know, I mean, it's good to it's good to know what your current ratio is and your quick ratio is, but it looks like so it's 0.67 for 2016. Did anybody get 2014? I'll do it here real quickly. If what did you get for 2014? Okay, so somebody got one. So remember, the, the heuristic is that, or one, one point, two different answers. I think, um, so, so 2014, no problem, no problem. Um, so two, four, two, let's assume that it's 1.47 for every, for every dollar of liability. Let me remember shit hits the fan. Like, liabilities that I have to generate right away, I have a dollar and 47 cents. So I can cover that. But then once we get to 2016, I'm out. So what do I do if I'm out of money? What do I do if I'm in the situation of Mary's leather goods in 2016? Let's say it's not a, let's say that there's no PPP. Um, there's no, um, wh what do I do? I mean, it's the famous thing. You either you either need to to generate more money. You either need to get a get a loan, another loan, get more investors. So this is a place where it's a, it's definitely very danger. You know, you know, it's a danger zone. So that's the idea of the balance sheet is to is to watch it and use it as a tool for growing your business, but to use it as a tool for growing at a pace that 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 you feel comfortable with. Sure. Um, you know, there might be some like kind of um, common thoughts about like, you don't want to go um, under this ratio, but you might feel comfortable with X or Y, but at least you want to know kind of where you're at, because especially I think the quick ratio is an extremely important. So those are the two things that we wanted to talk about with respect to the, the balance sheet. And now we're going to dive into the income statement or the profit and loss, as somebody said earlier. And I'm looking at the time. I'm like, oh no, <laughs> there's not. Uh, I always know it, it, it. It'll it'll go as quick. So um, if you have any questions, definitely put them in the chat. Okay. So remember, with the balance sheet that we were talking about, it's a snapshot shot of time. It it's just basically what your asset and liabilities are. You know, at one little point of time. We looked at it. Let me go back to the 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 previous sheet. We looked at it on December 31st. Of each of these years so it's just one day but now when we get into the to the income statement or the profit and loss we're looking at it over a period of time and and that's a decision that's a business decision right some people you know it's important to look at your you know profit and loss you know every month for some it might be just every three months for others it might be every day or every three days so that's that's a so um, that's that's a decision that um, that you that you can make, but we're going to be looking at it from the perspective of one month here, and we're going back to Mary's leather goods, and this is the one I want to breeze over pretty quickly because I think this is the one that most of you are pretty familiar with. I mean, this is I mean this is like a budget, right? We've got money coming in, so we've got sales revenue coming in, and then we're going to take out the cost associated with making the product or service, or the cost of associated with selling the product or service. 
and then we get to the gross profit, and then we're gonna, and then we get, then we um, look at all of our operating expenses, and then we get all the way down to the bottom where we have um, net profit before taxes. And we'll talk about why we want to look at net profit before taxes versus um, versus um, after taxes. So sales revenue, you know, if the, you know this this kind of workshop is geared. Um, towards, you know, really small micro enterprises. So here's somebody who's starting something. They're making uh, 28K the first year, 36K the third year, and then 64K uh, the, the next year. So that's a, that's a good trajectory. Um, what do you see? Let's take some big observations. Um, what, what, what trends or what are, what are some current concerns or what are some opportunities that you see when you look at year to year uh, Mary's um, um, leather goods, different income statements. Yes. <laughs> what happened to contract wages? So one thing I want to just take a step back and 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 go over. I think a lot of you got it, but cost of sales. So we take we start with our revenue at the top, and then we're going to take out the costs that are specific to whatever we're selling. So if I, again, let me go back to the cookie example. If I have a cookie business, then I'm gonna take out, of course, the, the cogs would be the flour, the butter, the chocolate chips, the, the sugar and so forth, because each unit of those corresponds directly to um, a unit of, uh, of sales. Once we get under the gross profit margin, then these operating expenses are more, are more fixed, right? Or they might be variable, but they might, they're not necessarily associated directly with selling one extra unit. And, and um, so, that, so that's, a, that's an important distinction. So Greta says, what happened on the contract wages? Absolutely. So it looks like that if we, it looked like that probably Mary was just doing this all herself. Maybe it was even kind of a side hustle for the first couple of years. And then in 2016, brought somebody in part time um, as a as a contractor. Uh, it looks like there's some sales commissions, so maybe like there somehow um, somebody's getting paid for helping support um, Mary sell leather goods. Any other observations that you see? I hear something really light. That might be somebody just who's unmuted. Okay. Yeah. So, so rent went up, went up. As Sarah said, isn't that true? The things that we consider as fixed expenses in businesses typically are fixed within the year, but over the long term, they tend to go up. So we have to account for those, those fixed expenses that aren't really fixed. That's a good observation. I mean, let me just jump to the bottom. Like here, here um, Mary is making revenues of 30K the first year, 64K in the third year. And look at her, look at how much she's, she's actually pocketing. Does that concern you at all? So her net, her net profit is a, Fifteen hundred the first year, twenty twenty eight hundred the third year. So it's we can calculate what that is, but it looks like it's a pretty low, you know, profit net profit margin. So that concerns me. Um, but let's start with let's start with like what I think is especially if you have a this is a little bit harder for tech companies, but if you're selling a product or a service and you can actually directly um, communicate certain things that are connected with the sale of that service or product, um, then you really want to spend a lot of time up in this first part is the cost of the sale. Um, so, um, so for the first part, you, you calculate, and I'm going to come back to my little worksheet here. And by the way, this worksheet is in the handout packet that I gave you. Uh, if you go all the way down, um, the financial ratios that we're talking about today is in the very final page. So you can go back and, 
um, practice the calculations yourself. Um, so, but we're, so let me, so, so we're jumping to the gross profit margin. So, so the gross profit margin is pretty straightforward. It's, it's you take the gross profit and you divide it by the revenue. Mm -hmm. So can somebody, what's 50, let's just even do what's 15 divided by 29. That would give you a rough um, gross profit margin for 2014. So let's have people again, A, um, January through July, do 2014, people who are, um, uh, I guess I said July, August through December do 2016. So what do we got? So Gre Greta, you put 50%, what, what for what year was that? Was that so for? Actually, you know, you could be much more exact, but roughly, roughly, um, and you'd have to move your gross margin a little bit to the right. You know, roughly, roughly, her cost of goods sold um, when she was doing it herself was, you know, a little richer in 2014 when she was doing it out of her garage uh, or where, whatever. Um, and it's a little less than 50% when she's doing it as a real going concern. You know, where mm -hmm. this is being eaten up is the operating expenses. Okay. However, and, and just a real quick comment. Um, this is a, this is a manufactured good and she's mm -hmm. doing it with roughly a cost of goods sold. She's got a, a margin of just under 50%. I don't know what that is with regards to her industry. Yeah. But the real questions you'd have to dive into if you were looking at whether she's in trouble in the long term is if she can grow, like if she could double her business every two years, and if her operating expenses were going to remain flat, she's doing pretty good. If her operating yeah. expenses are going to continue to increase every year at the rate she's going, she's going to, she's going to fold. Yeah. So that's the question is, can she continue in the current location with the current professional services, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, so one thing, one challenge I would put for Mary's leather goods is we already know, we already know what her total net profit is. It's pretty slim, right? And it's not like she's a grocery store that has a ton of sales that can support a really slim uh, net, you know, a net profit margin. This is, this is the big key right here. When, it, when we look at the, the, the COGS and, and, and she's at about 50%, I know it's changing a little bit each year, but this is, a, this is already kind of a really challenging place to be. So <clears throat> if she was to take a step back, I mean, if I, was, if I was working with Mary, I'd say, you gotta figure out a way to get your COGS smaller because right now they're about 50%. Um, I know it's going to be different for each industry, um, like like Greta said. But again, for especially for a lot of you micro enterprises, if your if your cogs are much more than 30, 35 yeah. percent, um, it's going to be really tough because, like Greta said, the, your gross profit margin is only the amount of money that, that's not your profit. That's the amount of that's the amount of money that you have to service now your operating expenses. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, so I think we could keep on going and calculate what her net profit margin is. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is she's either got to raise prices, get cheaper inputs, or, or like Greta said, maybe if she really expands. But I think that there's going to be a challenge that even as she gets bigger, this is going to be really, it's, it's all, see, the thing is, as she gets bigger, if her, usually cogs stay relatively similar there's you know i mean you have similar inputs so there's not as much economies of scale that you can get and so um so th this is a big challenge now some of you also might at some point be hoping to sell your business and let me tell you if you're looking if an investor is looking at this business and they see that their cogs are about 50 percent you know that's a that's like you you might be the best marketer in the world but it's going to be it's going to be hard to 
to, to find enough margins to make that work. Um, so any other observations? Um, I think on your own time, um, be just be in the in the nature in the interest of time we're not going to talk about your net profit margin but i do want to i do want to put a couple of things in the in your handout packet there's you know an explanation of it so for your gross profit margin you're saying that for every dollar of revenue that you generate in in the in the last case 50 percent is going to cover operating expenses well for the net profit margin Every dollar that you receive, every dollar that um, your business receives, what? This is how much you're actually pocketing. Either you're 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 taking it home, or you're investing it back into the business. The reason that that I that we have the um, the the that you might want to start by calculating your net profit margin. Um, before taxes is because once you put bring taxes into play, there's so many variables that could kind of make it not very comparable. So if you're comparing your net, if you're calling like industry peers and saying, hey, just, you know, like we're competitors or maybe it's maybe it's a peer across the country. So you're not a directly comp competitor and you're saying, hey, what, what sort of like net profit margins are you looking at? You're gonna wanna talk about before taxes because you don't know how their business is structured you don't know like 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 what sort of um, expenses they're writing off or what have you. So definitely, um, for analysis, you want to look at before taxes. But I know that at the end of the day, you're trying to make money, and so you might want to look at after taxes as well. Okay, so we're going to take a deep breath. <laughs> and does anybody have any any more thoughts um, on the income statement before we move to the cash flow? So as a kind of precursor to the cash flow, let's talk about cash flow planning. This is um, there's been the, there's been studies recently. I had I saw CFED did a study um, talking about what are the biggest challenges that small businesses face, and above accessing even cap capital is cash flow challenges. So let me ask you a little pop quiz here. If your sales go up, does that mean the does that mean that the cash in your in your business checking account goes up. Put a Y for yes, a no, an N for no, or a question mark for, or a D for it depends. <laughs> this is a seasoned lot, absolutely. It, it can depend, but the answer is definitely not yes. So let's do another one. If your profits go up, so you're looking at your income statement and year in, year out, you're seeing profit, you're seeing your net profit margin increase and your profit is going up. Does that mean that your cash and your business checking is going up? Yes, no, or depends. Look at these, look at the Ariel. Fantastic, fantastic. Hopefully, hopefully, yes, I, I like that. So let's take a look at one more kind of story of, of looking at Mary's um, cash flow. And let me get out an annotation tool. So here we are at the start of January, 2015. Mary has $2,020 uh, 2020, $2, in the bank. At the end, of 20 of 2015 December of 2015 she ends the year with three thousand dollars three thousand one hundred and six dollars in the bank so I don't know about you but I look at this at, at first and I'm like okay not bad she kept she she actually increased the amount of money that she has in the bank so what we're doing is we're basically you know money coming in so we got sales coming in accounts receivables coming in and then money going out, cash distributions, and then we have adjustments here. And then all of a sudden, once we get down to here at the end of the month, 21, uh, 2140, we carry that up to the next month. So that's kind of how the, the flow of this worksheet is working. Now, this is a retrospective. Another, you know, a lot of times people use 
uh, cash flow planning to project, to write, to project the year ahead and to make sure that you have the, the cash on hand when you need it. But, uh, but of course, since many of you are in, in business, uh, it's really powerful to, to actually look at your cash, uh, your cash flow budget from the last year. So when did you have money on hand? When, we, when were your expenses? When was money coming in? So what do we see here? Again, paint for me the story because it's not as simple as we started with 2000 and we ended with 3000. It looks like there might've been some bumps along the road. In fact, ding, 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 April, she had $41 in the bank. I don't know if, about you, but for a small business, that's probably a little bit scary, especially if you have employees and you gotta make payroll. What, um, what happened? What are some things that changed? And again, you can be looking on the PDF on your own screen or the, the Zoom here. Yep. So Eric, Eric mentions new material purchases. Look at, yeah, there's some big purchases kind of periodically right there. Absolutely. Anything else that new debts taken out? Oh yes. What do we got? New debts. Boom. That month that she almost that that Mary almost was in the negative. It looks like she took out some new debt in that month. And it looks like her debt service um, has increased after that. Absolutely. Any other, any other observations? What do we know on the cash receipt side? What do we see here looking at sales? Any observations? Well, what, I don't know about you, but I'm looking at her cash sales. They kind of, they started out kind of okay. And then over the summer, they really got much bigger and then they petered out a little bit and then they kind of went up again over the holidays. So what, what yeah, Greta says, get <laughs> Greta, Greta is on us on the receivables. Good, thank you on that. It looks like, but, but yeah, I mean, this is a seasonal business. How many of you have put have seasonal businesses? Put put a why in put a why if you got some seasonality to your business, and n if you don't have seasonality. If you have seasonality to your sales, you got to do some cash flow planning. If you have irregularity to your expenses, you got to do some cash flow planning. And really, with the time that we have. It almost is as simple as that because you just need to make sure that the numbers line up, that you have, you have cash on hand when you need cash on hand to go out. And that's, a, and that's just, it's just about planning and, uh, and, and making sure. So, you know, I mean, the example I love to say is if you've got an ice cream business and you open up your ice cream, you know, food cart, and all of a sudden, June's going good. Then July is going better. You bring on an employee. August is doing even better. And you're like, wow, I'm really expanding. I'm going to buy a whole lot of dairy. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to invest in a brick and mortar. You got to know the seasonality. I'm not telling you anything that you don't know. What I'm hoping that you do, and I think you have a blank sheet on your, on, in your packet. And of course you can do this in QuickBooks too, or even better. I mean, you know, don't use our, uh, don't you know? Use like something digital, but I think it's really powerful to on a physical piece of paper, just kind of a back of the napkin, kind of forecast. What do you think are going to be some of your big expenses this year? When do you think are going to be peaks in your sales? And then you can actually you could even just use a highlighter and just like highlight these are the months that I think are big sales. These put in little dots where you expect. Um, big expenditures, and then and then of course a more robust um, analysis and making sure um, you know just making sure that you've got the cash on hand and a little bit of a safety cushion um, so that you can meet those expenses when when they come due. So this was like way too quick, but a quick rundown on your three 
you know, main financial and state statements, and then a couple little tools for, for how to read them and how to look at them in, um, in a, in a, in a, in a more rich way. So, um, we are ending, um, but I, I will hang around for some discussion or Q and A, and I understand that some of you may have to, to go. So, uh, awesome. Well, huge round of applause for Ross. Woo! That was awesome. Thank you so much. Yay. Um, hey, everybody, I just posted again the upcoming events in the chat and also Moneymaker. Please let me know if you didn't apply and you'd like to. I can sneak you in the back door because we'd love to get everyone on board. It's such a great program. Um, I will send out the recording and um, also Ross's resources that he shared in an email right after this. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. Let's for just anybody, for anybody who's viewing the recording, I'll, we'll probably keep the resources up for a month or so. So, but after that, it might not, it might be down. So if you're watching this in like six months, go, go pluck it now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that includes all the, the pages of how to figure out the, the current ratio and the quick ratio and all of that. That's right. Yeah. So in there is the, the uh, slides of the slides mm -hmm. that we went over plus the handout. 